everybody. Uh, so just quick introduction. So uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Alec Koltz, uh, my old friend from many years ago. In the meantime, he went from with a quite a career on various interesting uh, places in US. So now at the last stage, he's in Twitter. Before he was in Microsoft and uh, Life Labs. Uh, he was doing successfully Life Labs a little bit less, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, before he was in AOL uh, fighting spam, so he has good experience on that side. Uh, uh, and before he had startup, um, so uh, he's one of these, um, I would say, old guard of machine learners and data miners, and one of these early text miners uh, from. Uh, late 90s, so pretty much when the area went uh, up, and so he saw uh, uh, many things from academic academic side and and uh, industrial side, which uh, which is uh, uh, I guess makes him very uh, uh, competent uh, for this topic. So um, this talk today will, uh, uh, as I said, so now he works at uh, Twitter, and uh, the talk today would be really to to show and to describe what's the. Uh, how Twitter looks from the other side. Um, and uh, you're all welcome to ask questions, interrupt him. Uh, uh, he knows to answers to most of the questions, maybe not uh, every single detail, but ma 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 many of them, uh, the, the, the hard ones only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, let, let's start. We have roughly now 80, 80 minutes. Uh, then we need to leave because there's a next event here. Uh, Alec, please. Well, thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction. And uh, I just gave this talk at uh, X Like. That's why we both wear the X Like t shirts. Um, so the title of the talk is Research at Twitter, which is a little bit different from what you saw in the email which uh, Marcus sent for marketing, but uh, that's pretty much the same. Uh, so I'm a data scientist in Twitter right now. I work at the user modeling group. Um, so the research which I'm going to be talking about is going to be connected to what I'm doing, my group is doing, and people we interact with doing. So just uh, as a disclaimer, it probably doesn't cover everything that Twitter is doing in research. Uh, we've grown quite a bit over the years, um, but hopefully it's going to be interesting. Um, so I'd like to... Uh, start uh, introdu introducing Twitter by just giving this uh, uh, simple example from uh, a few years ago, uh, just capturing the gist of what Twitter is all about. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's an event. It's a major event in the, in the local area. Uh, Los Angeles, in this case, there was a, a moderate earthquake. Uh, things happen. Um, nothing too, too dramatic, but uh, what is important here is that the timeline of uh, information dissemination about this event. Um, so it took quite a few minutes for the uh, national media to pick up that there was something going on in LA at that time. Um, it was relatively short for the local news, but still a considerable amount of time before it actually got on the air, people actually heard about it. And clearly people on Twitter found out about it in, the, in a very short amount of time. Uh, but Kind of from the R&D perspective, the interesting question here is that, okay, uh, somebody tweeted about it in, within five seconds, but um, who found out about this event? Uh, so did it actually connect the right people at the right time? Did people in LA find out about it, or was it somebody else who was connected to somebody in LA who found out about this event? So um, from the kind of R&D perspective, the interesting thing is like how to make such events uh, noticeable to people to whom they should be delivered, in this case, mostly people in LA. Um, another well-known example of uh, Twitter usage is the, the various kind of pro-democracy movements, uprisings, and so on and so forth, um, which see a lot of uh, engagement in social media. Twitter is just one example, obviously there's others, um, but clearly o Occupy Wall Street movements, the Arab Spring movements, and and other movements like that uh, um, are things where people actually flock to social media and try to self-organize and find the relevant information outside of the regular channels. Um, so in this case, you see a bunch of hashtags that people use to uh, channel information about the relevant events. Um, but again, the kind of interesting question is, how, how do people find out about those um, hashtags in this case? 
Um, is that something that you know, we, can we can help people with, or is it something that really needs to be just developing organically? Uh, and how do we connect those two things? So a few words about the scale of Twitter today. Um, it has more than 200 million active users. Where active users are people who basically use it quite often. They tweet and consume tweets and interact with Twitter in other ways, such as searching. Um, all people send about 400 million tweets per day. And there's about over 400 million unique visitors to the Twitter.com domain per month, although most people actually use Twitter in, in a mobile fashion, using mobile phones, uh, iPhones, Android phones, Windows phones, and uh, actually regular phones via SMS as well. So we support over 35 languages. Uh, that means that Twitter is localized in over 35, 35 languages. But the number of languages spoken on Twitter is much larger. Um, and probably you cannot determine the accurate number uh, uh, very well because of the long tail effects there. Um, most people, interestingly, uh, reside outside of the US. So if you look at the research literature, people focus on the English Twitter, although uh, a lot of people using Twitter are not really English speaking users, although some of them actually use English and the native tongue. And uh, just to throw it in, this is the um, record tweet per second uh, so far that we've seen in the service, and those records actually keep on jumping up and up uh, with major events. So I'm going to be talking about this, the, the internal research, the things that uh, we think are important uh, to improve the user experience. And I'd like to contrast it a little bit from the academic research. So Twitter, to a large extent, is, uh, is an open uh, platform. And uh, data is, to a large extent, open. Uh, so anybody can use the free streaming API to get a small sample of tweets. Um, the various larger data sets uh, that have been released, for example, in conjunction with the Trek conference uh, and some other corporate exists that people use for publications. So that explains to a large extent why we see so many Twitter-related papers in academia and people focus on whatever is interesting to their particular area from social sciences to data mining to graph mining to, um, to any area which connects all of those things. Uh, <coughs> so to some extent, the the research that people do on tweets and Twitter is very, very broad. And um, not necessarily all of it is e equally important for us internally. Um, so really, our focus is uh, a little bit more short term, a little bit more about what can we do to make Twitter better? Uh, what, make we do, what, what can we do to make uh, uh, the relevance and the information found on Twitter uh, better for our users and how to help users to connect with relevant information? Um, so that's really what I want to talk about today. So I'll, I'll introduce the kind of key problems, the key application-related problems that uh, are very apparent when you use Twitter, and uh, how to decompose them a little bit to the standard uh, problems that we see in research, such as graph mining and uh, text mining, and so on and so forth. Um, and then I'll describe a little bit of the challenges of doing those things at scale. Um, and talk a little bit about the infrastructure that uh, needs to support um, large-scale um, uh, data mining using, uh, using this data. So let's start with the uh, problems we're trying to uh, focus on. Um, so one is the relevance uh, broadly defined. And uh, in this particular case, the relevance is, uh, is in the context of search. Uh, so search is a very, a very important component of Twitter. Uh, people uh, search in, in increasing numbers. And uh, so what do they search for? Um, they search for other people, not surprisingly, because Twitter is, after all, a form of social network. Uh, so people want to discover who else is on Twitter, uh, if they hear or know about, uh, say, a celebrity or somebody they actually want to connect with, how do they actually find them? So they use search for that purpose. Um, and another key area is, uh, obviously, um, events. Um, so very often pe people hear about Twitter in conjunctions of, say, listening to a radio program, a TV program. They find out that people tweet about those things. They come to Twitter and want to find out more. Uh, so clearly the, the usage of search is very heterogeneous. So connecting to people, connecting to events, connecting maybe to factual topics. Um, so now the question is, 
how to incorporate those signals um, to provide a very robust uh, relevance ranking, which is going to fire on every um, query. Another problem is uh, who to follow. Um, so that's our uh, catch name for building out the social graph. So it's um, a little bit related to what I talked about just in the, in the last slide. Um, so people search to connect other people, but obviously we want to provide recommendations, uh, which is especially important for new users. So if you come to Twitter today, um, how do you figure out um, what is interesting on Twitter? How do you actually get those you know, interesting recommendations that this person may be an interesting source, given what you have um, chosen or told us about your interest before? Uh, so who to follow is uh, a form of recommending other users to, um, to you so that uh, you increase your, the density of your network and, and receive more relevant information. Again, it's a fairly difficult problem to, to do uh, well, especially for new users. So obviously, in, in this case, we face all, all matters of cold start problems that uh, people are seeing elsewhere. Um, and counter recommendation is um, the flip side of this. Um, so yes, people follow other people, uh, but in addition of this, you can think about the various forms of connecting interesting events and stories and media and other forms of uh, data to users, even if they don't happen to be following somebody producing those events. Um, and even if they do, they may have actually uh, skipped over those events because they didn't check the timeline at the right time. Uh, so how do we notify uh, people about interesting information for them uh, in such a way that is uh, inobtrusive and quite relevant? So those are the kind of broadly speaking key problems that you want to attack um, uh, from the uh, tourist perspective. And now, you know, how do we actually do this? Um, so decomposing them a little bit into um, kind of traditional research problems. So we have a mix of a recommendation of personalization with clustering and uh, text mining classification thrown in. Um, so the question is, you know, which ones are, are the more important ones and how to solve all, all those components uh, given Twitter data and Twitter users. So the key research areas are um, not necessarily in order of relevance, but uh, there's graph mining, obviously, with, with the Twitter graph, which connects users. Um, we have content classification and tagging. Um, we have recommender style problems, so user recommendation, content recommendation. Uh, we have search and, broadly speaking, information retrieval. And we have various infrastructure components which tie those things together and make it happen. So let's start with graph mining. So graph mining has been growing increasingly in importance in the uh, in various uh, R&D contexts, and uh, obviously the, the web mining is kind of the, the key graph mining people know of. Um, but with the increasing importance of social media, we have a lot of graph mining which focuses just on social graphs or connects social graphs with the web graph into more heterogeneous problems. So in our case, the follow graph is the key component. So on Twitter, people follow other people so those are, those are directed connections in the graph. So if somebody follows somebody else, it doesn't mean the connection is reciprocated. Although if it is reciprocated, it, it is by itself interesting. Because we have various entities on Twitter. Some of them are actually real people. They may know each other, for example. They could be family members. So in this case, the, this reciprocity is much more likely. But they could be also institutions. They could be news outlets, in which case you're probably not very likely to be reciprocated by, say, CNN, because CNN doesn't know you, although you know CNN. So the question is, um, first of all, to understand what is the structure of this graph, how this graph evolves over time, what are the properties of it, how can we use those properties to actually, one, to provide good recommendations for people to follow, and the second, to have other kind of tangential properties which are useful in recommendation elsewhere, such as, say, user reputation. Um, do things like standard page rank work on this graph, or do we need to do something else? Um, how do we actually use this information to analyze the spread of uh, various events or information on Twitter 
uh, which is some people call information diffusion, which has been studied in academia quite a bit. So photograph today, um, I mentioned before that uh, there's about 200 million active users on Twitter. If we restrict connections in the photograph just to this group of people, uh, we have about 20 billion edges. So it's a, it's a fairly large graph. Uh, and it's a, it's a power law graph. Uh, there's a lot of people with very few connections. And uh, as I'm showing here, uh, as of right now, there's over 1,000 people with more than 1 million followers. And there's more than 25 with over 10 million followers. So clearly, the distribution is skewed. And uh, some people get a lot of connections. So WTF is the acronym of uh, who to follow, uh, which uh, some might claim it should, be, should have been named whom to follow, but uh, the who to follow is stuck. And uh, people didn't join us. Yes, these people, these this critics are not here, thankfully. Um, <coughs> there was a long discussion these days about whether it's who or who. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a linguist. I'm not qualified to really answer those questions. Uh, uh, but in terms of what it looks like, uh, or the results of this recommendation, what it looks like on, on the survey itself, uh, can be shown um, kind of on the left here. Uh, so if you log in to Twitter, your account, uh, you're going to see recommendations like this. Uh, so uh, those are the what we call organic recommendations. And there is one which actually is very similar, but it represents a, a promoted uh, or paid for recommendation. Uh, that's a form of uh, advertising on Twitter. Um, so the flip side of recommending people to other people is they finding similar people to, to a given person. So let's say you actually followed somebody else. Um, you're going to see something like you see on the right side here. Um, so those are people who are actually similar um, to this person. And it's, a, it's an important distinction because, let's say, if you're recommending uh, a bunch of accounts to, um, to, to a given user, uh, you probably don't want to just focus on things that are very, very similar to each other. Uh, so there is a diversity component in the recommendation you need to be cognizant of. But if you actually go to somebody else's account um, and you're in the mood of, say, expanding some, some topical area that uh, you're interested in, then you may be interesting following through with those accounts as well. So how, how does the service work? And um, so obviously, uh, this could be done in many different ways, from very simple to very sophisticated. Um, and we've been doing a lot of um, experiments and, and R&D on this for probably the last four years. Um, uh, one component, which is quite important, is, uh, is called the circle of trust. Uh, the circle of trust uh, is a result of a, a random walk which is centered on the, the given user. So we call it the egocentric random walk, uh, which captures the direct neighborhood of a given node uh, in the outgoing and incoming edges. So those could be users who are basically very important in terms of hub connectivity, and they connect to, they're followed by a given user. Uh, also, this could be important users who point or point to a given user. So we do this circle of trust computation as the stepping stone uh, to the final form of the algorithm. And the final form of the algorithm as of today is based on the well-known SALSA algorithm, which is this uh, bipartite graph walks, um, like so here. So on the left side, we have the hubs. Um, on the right side, we have the so-called authorities, although in this case, it's a, it's a loose um, analogy. Um, the hubs correspond to the, the circle of trust of a given user. And the authorities correspond to users who are followed by those guys. And um, there's various, obviously, tweaks and details to this uh, formalism uh, in terms of maybe not selecting all the hubs, maybe not selecting all the authorities, and uh, looking at uh, uh, various uh, components of the salsa, like how many walks to perform, and uh, how to prune edges, and so on and so forth. But the gist is that we start like several random walks, starting from the left side, 
going to the right side, coming back, and starting from the right side, going to the left side, and coming back. So this gives us a set of scores, which is uh, the authority scores and the hub scores. Uh, so in this case, the hub scores are going to be the scores ranking users according to the similarity of a given user, and the authority scores are going to be the scores which correspond to how likely we think this guy is going to be followed through if we provide this recommendation. And how well it works. Um, <coughs> so this is a quick comparison uh, based on the actual A-B study. Uh, what we see on the vertical axis is the follow-through rate. And here we have a bunch of algorithms. Um, so Salsa clearly wins in this case by a large margin, followed by personal page rank, um, followed by a various kind of heuristically motivated algorithms. Um, one important thing here is that this is not set in stone. So just the fact that we achieve this kind of a performance on one particular time slide doesn't mean forever because the graph is evolving all the time and the usage of Twitter is evolving all the time. But this has been fairly robust for you know, some time. <coughs> so the follow graph is uh, one type of a graph that uh, heavy graph mining is applied to. But you can think of other graphs which connect to this graph. And one such graph is going to be the engagement graph. Uh, which may be not represented as a formal graph, but it's more or less an event graph. So given that somebody is engaging with one particular tweet or one particular like, URL or one particular event, we can think of there is a connection from this user to this piece of content, for example, um, which is quite similar to, say, the click graph uh, in terms of the application of the click graph in web mining. Um, which is quite important to providing the relevant signal. So other recommendations, good or not. Uh, is this person interested in this type of a content versus a different type of a content? So the question here is uh, how to actually um, analyze the results provided by you know, this graph in some profitable way. Profitable means in, it can boost the relevance somewhere. And um, if you combine those two graphs and also maybe something else, um, you kind of get to the problem of heterogeneous graph mining, which is a little bit more complex, it's just simple random walks on the follow graph, <coughs> where you want to co connect different types of nodes, users, events, tweets, URLs, videos, um, and essentially have some kind of a unified algorithm which is going to provide relevant signals for user-to-user -user recommendation, user-to-content recommendations, user-to-event recommendations. Uh, so this is something we are actually focusing on uh, quite heavily as well. So this brings us to uh, the user slash content categorization or, or classification. Why is it interesting? Well, uh, if you want to recommend uh, content to people, we want to recommend what actually people are interested in. Uh, what type of content right now uh, is interesting to people? What kind of content is interesting to people long term? What type of content is interesting to people in various different contexts? So this becomes a fairly difficult problem very fast. <coughs> since people have very diverse sets of interests and uh, their connectivity reflects the uh, not necessarily just their interests, but also their social ties. So I may be following some account because I'm interested in the content. I may be following a different account just because I have some relationship with this person. I actually ignore all the content from this person. Um, my interaction doesn't need to reflect my interest in some cases because of various things like um, in some particular UI, the tweets are very short and very legible. So I don't need to actually be clicking on them to get more information. I get it right away. In a different context, it's hard to read. Maybe you want to follow through the URL, so engagement may be high. But again, it's, uh, it's not uniform. It may vary from user to user and from content to content. <coughs> and lastly, some interest can be passed by analyzing the query logs, so what people search for. But again, not everybody is searching, and some people may be searching uh, only in certain contexts because maybe they're already so well connected they get all the events. Uh, but they want to find other users or vice versa. 
So um, <coughs> in addition to this, if we want to analyze the um, topical categories which are connected to tweets, there are the obvious problems that a lot of people have uh, uh, stumbled upon. One key one is tweets are very short and very noisy. Uh, some tweets are informative, some tweets are really not informative. Uh, tweets come in multiple languages. Um, and there is the time sensitivity, so in terms of figuring out what person is interesting in, you know, we need to really always take into account that things are happening in real time. <coughs> so just to give an overview of how we can solve or try to solve this problem, um, let's look at, say, topic attribution to a given person. So in Twitter, there's a way of uh, tagging users of, with certain topics. And we can say a user has been tagged by other users by a bunch of topics. We can say, in this case, this person is likely to be, say, tweeting about this uh, distribution of topics. Um, but just looking at this signal alone may be not very comprehensive, because uh, obviously we cannot count on everybody being tagged in this way. And sometimes the tags, given that the tags are free form, free text, uh, they don't really represent very well what this user may be tweeting about. And the tags can be coming, say, from somewhere else altogether, like the life of this person outside of Twitter. So let's say you've got a sports player who is tagged with sports, he may actually be just tweeting about music, you know, his favorite song. Um, <clears throat> so this is not necessarily an authority on, on sports from the content production point of view. But in some sense, we can get a useful signal by mining this type of information on a per user level and applying them in some kind of like a prior fashion. <clears throat> so once we derive those kind of priors in the per user level, um, we can try to connect them to the actual content of the tweet. Um, so in some sense, tweets are very short. Um, they're, very, they're not very verbose. Uh, but they tend to contain useful things like entities, for example. Uh, so the entities which are very organic to Twitter, obviously hashtags. Hashtags are not really controlled by us, they're really user generated all through. <coughs> but very often hashtags are semantically connected to the content of the tweet. So they may be representing something like very simple, like say boxing or football, or some kind of a concert. Uh, if you go to conferences, as most of you probably do, uh, there's typically some kind of a hashtag just for the conference itself, which just, just captures the event. Maybe not very topical, it's, in this case, it, it's event-driven. And hashtags uh, correspond entities such as mentions. So in multiple person conversations, people can stuff uh, the handles of other users in the tweet itself. In which case, I know that you know, this tweet is relevant maybe to the content produced, the represented of um, the users involved in this conversation. And there is the presence of URLs, which is especially important in news dissemination, which may tell me, OK, this tweet provides a commentary about a particular topic, where the topic is represented by the content of the URL. And we did actually interesting research of uh, using the tweets as a, a form of anchor text uh, in a similar fashion that anchor text provides a uh, boosting value for figuring out what URLs are about in the web and improving the search. In a very similar fashion, tweets can be thought of as a form of uh, anchor text, which is more timely as, as regular anchor text. <coughs> so in a simple way, uh, those multimodal uh, um, Content models can be merged together. So let's say we have uh, a tweet level model, we're just talking to a URL level model um, in, a, in a real piece of infrastructure that we build. Uh, we probably need to integrate those two together as the tweets are being generated. Um, so that from the R&D perspective, the, um, the key questions are how can we actually get um, know the best performance possible by doing this kind of integration early on. So clearly as uh, the tweets are being generated, um, we don't know a lot of information about what is going to happen to those tweets later on. So over time, the tweets are again being engaged in, they're going to be uh, retweeted, they're going to be faved you know, by a lot of people, there's going to be some commentary coming to those tweets. But uh, 
as the tweets are being generated, we probably just know that the tweets may or may not contain some kind of URL, was produced by somebody, and contains this piece of text. So given all of this, how can we classify this thing? <clears throat> so you think about it, this type of classification is really um, a multi-class, multi-label problem because uh, each tweet can uh, describe multiple topics. Uh, it's very common to see commentaries which are, say, about, say, movies and politics and some random forms of commentary about uh, lifestyle and, and so on and so forth. And uh, so any given tweet can contain uh, quite a few topics and sometimes none whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have organic labels uh, coming from tagging of users and also ca coming from tagging of tweets. Um, those organic ontology, if, if, if you like, are, are fairly difficult to work with because they're very high dimensional, uh, they're very dynamic, uh, and they're also very noisy. Uh, so one of the key challenges of, kind of trying to solve this problem is actually getting a form of labeled data. Uh, so multi-labeled uh, problems are gaining more and more interest in the, in the research community, uh, but I think from our perspective also generally, uh, one of the uh, key components is, uh, or key problems is how to get quality data that reflects this problem in the multi-label sense. <clears throat> um, and evaluating those things is, uh, is also quite challenging. Um, so clearly in Twitter, uh, we don't have a single distribution which captures uh, the distribution of all users. Everybody can have a different distribution. Also the distribution of uh, content may be very application specific. So say if you want to judge the content categorization quality in respect to search, it's going to be different when you look at, say, the Discover tab uh, versus you know, just somebody's timeline versus timeline of various different types of accounts. Uh, so figuring out how to build quality models which meet your performance bars over some distribution um, is, is really quite, quite a hairy problem given that you have so many distributions to choose from. <clears throat> I think I mentioned this, uh, uh, there is also the question that uh, is this tweet about some easily identifiable topic or is it about something else altogether? Um, so this has been noticed uh, um, over the years by a few people in the sense that if you look at uh, just a random sample of tweets, you may discover that those tweets are not necessarily about something that may be interesting to a larger population of users but this may be essentially a personal update, something about me today. You know, I feel bad, I feel good. Um, well, this definitely carries some information, but it may not be interesting to, say, surface this in search for a general population if they search on the, for a keyword which appears in, in the tweet itself. So from, for us to be able to, to, say, classify tweets into some kind of an ontology, for example, or some tag space, we actually need to figure out what tweets are about easily identifiable topics and what tweets are really about this kind of dark DNA, <coughs> junk DNA, or things corresponding to chatter, various conversations, and, uh, and personal updates. So <clears throat> one way to attack this problem is uh, look through uh, topic modeling. So the word topic modeling is typically applied in the context of uh, um, LDA, and here's an example of uh, a topic which was identified by LDA mining um, over some corpus of tweets. And uh, <clears throat> if we run LDA of, uh, on, on a, a large corpus of tweets, we like it to ident identify things like the, in the top where they're clearly about some topic, like in this case, like probably Harry Potter discussion, uh, <clears throat> some government politics discussion, um, something about nonprofits and so on and so forth. But we also have examples like in the bottom where uh, those, uh, if you were to be forced to assign the topical category to this uh, topic, it would be actually quite hard pressed. They're not actually clearly 
identifiable. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the question is, what is the breakdown of, uh, of topics? Of which, which ones are actually clearly identifiable, which ones are not? Um, and how does the distribution vary across various parameters uh, of our users and, uh, and percentages of content? Uh, so this is what we call the chatter detection. So in, um, in, in the studies we did, we essentially um, stratified the distributions based on the quality of user, which you can see on the, um, uh, on the horizontal axis, and also on the presence of various entities and tweets, such as hashtags, um, ad mentions, and URLs. Uh, and as you can see, the, the chatter is predominant in, in pretty much all categories, although um, the distribution is, is varied quite a lot, and, uh, and sometimes figuring out the, um, the correlation of the quality of the user to actually the preponderance of the using the chatter is quite difficult. Um, and this is probably better seen in this slide, uh, where you can see, based on the type of entity, how likely are we going to, fi to find chatter there versus uh, uh, topical content, and <coughs> the key findings are that uh, the uses of, uh, of mentions are really tied to conversations. So essentially, if somebody is talking in a you know, party to party mode, the party to multiple parties mode, um, they're much less likely to be actually focusing on a given topic, but maybe they just carry like a, a chatter like personal friendly conversation. Um, if they contain some kind of, uh, if, tweet, if the tweet contains some kind of an entity like a, a, a hashtag uh, or a URL, especially a URL, they're much likely to be focusing on anchoring the conversation or the comment on a particular topic, which refers somewhere else. Um, so the URLs are clearly very high indicators of topicality, and, you know, hashtags much less so, but if you look at the general population, uh, most tweets are not about easily identified topics. <clears throat> so we think about this uh, topical classification of tweets. Um, one thing which is quite important is the international support or inter internationalization of, of this effort. Um, as I mentioned before, there's more than 35 languages officially supported. There's so many users residing uh, outside of the US, and uh, clearly it's easier to um, focus development and research efforts just on English alone, because uh, that's what everybody else is using. Also, that's where they easily kind of classify data, or label data exists, but that doesn't really solve the problem for us. We really need to focus on providing similar capabilities for, um, for multiple languages and doing it efficiently. Um, and the kind of interesting questions here is that the, is the right ontology for English a right ontology for Spanish or for Japanese or for Korean? Uh, how do they differ? How do the interests of users differ? What are the, what are the differences between those distributions? Uh, but on a more practical level also, um, how to bootstrap models for English to other languages? Uh, what can we do? Uh, <coughs> can we just take models uh, built for English, apply some auto-translation uh, into English for, for, for documents which, which are known in other languages and get some results, or would this not really fly? Do we need to do something else? Uh, <coughs> uh, can we go uh, the other way and then um, take our label data, translate it into languages, and, uh, and build models in those languages over those corpora, or can we merge those two things together? Um, someone's going to be <coughs> providing answers here. I'm just trying to highlight those are important research problems which are far from being solved, and uh, in, in practice, you need to actually tackle them head on and figure out which wor what works, what doesn't work, uh, and what is cost effective in terms of development time and production. Uh, and research to production time. So lastly, um, speaking of content, uh, we have spam, which we shouldn't be forgetting about. Um, so as, as Marco 
was saying, spam is something I've been working on for quite a few uh, years now and uh, also a little bit of Twitter. And spam in social media is important because uh, social networks definitely attract spammers. Uh, any form of people-to-people -people communication attracts spammers. And spammers have the potential of destroying any, any conversation. Uh, so being able to fight spam is something that uh, all networks, all social networks need to be able to do quite well. Uh, so in this case, um, what this slide is showing is uh, just an example of spam interaction on a global scale. In this case, uh, those are um, ad mentioned tweets. So tweets in which case uh, somebody inserts somebody else's handle in the tweet. That means the tweet is going to be delivered to that person even if there is no connection, there is no follow connection between those two users. That's one particular form of spamming. Um, and you can see there is this intercontinental connections here um, coming sometimes to different places. Uh, but definitely, there is a high concentration of uh, spamming account in the US, uh, somewhere in South America, there's uh, Asian countries, India, of course, and, uh, and some others. Uh, this is from uh, uh, a couple of years ago, but those things are evolving quite rapidly over time, and something we need to uh, monitor. Um, but from the <coughs> more traditional R&D, um, the anti-spam is the kind of adversarial classification problem on, on a number of, uh, of different scales. So you can think of those problems of, as game theoretic problems, although not too many solutions uh, which are easily implementable uh, exist for game theory approaches. Um, but definitely we need to understand how the spammers operate, how the spammers obfuscate content, how the spammers obfuscate conversations, and various activities of uh, the account lifecycle, such as creating an account, uh, uh, bringing the account to the point where it achieves some kind of reputation where spam can be successful, and then spamming itself. So um, one such thing is really the adversarial games of uh, of actual tweeting, which is kind of interesting to show. Uh, one is that the tweet level, so you can, if you can think of the spammer delivering some kind of a, a payload, so the spammer definitely wants to deliver this payload to multiple people, and perhaps not to put too much effort in um, you know, typing this thing all the time or delivering an exactly the same message, because that's likely to be caught by some kind of a deduplication approach. Uh, so we see all kinds of uh, matter of injecting either random content, misspelling, things into, into the tweet itself. Uh, while at the same time, there is some invariance, such as the, uh, the payload in the sense of the URL embedded in the tweet, or maybe the handle of an account where they want to direct the users to actually go to and check the URL, which contains the payload. On a different level, the um, adversarial game is... Uh, connected to the uh, legitimate content stuffing. So spammers are cognizant of the fact that they spam, of course. Um, so they want to spam in every single tweet they send. So like shown here, essentially we have the spammy tweet interspersed with tweets which are more or less legitimate. Um, and uh, if you take the naive approach of, say, assigning the reputation to the user based on the spamminess of all the tweets they send or some kind of like a mean metric is likely to fail because the spammer can inject a fairly large number of legitimate content into what they do uh, and still uh, be able to successfully deliver enough spam to, to actually produce some money. And uh, <coughs> that's not all the story. Uh, the, the probably very interesting aspect of uh, how spammers operate is the, the, how the, the shadow economy works. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, people who basically concentrate on account creation. Um, and those people either use their accounts in, in some kind of a network of uh, mutual friendship that they have with other spammers, or they actually sell it on the black market. And we did some research of investigating how this black market actually operates. Um, so if you go to various shady sites, you can find that you can purchase Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and email uh, accounts from, say, you know, Hotmail and, and Google uh, for fairly uh, 
in fairly big chunks of 1,000 accounts. Um, and prices may vary on the uh, time of day and uh, time of month and, uh, and the actual security that attached to those accounts. But you can see that uh, uh, there's a fair range of uh, prices here. <coughs> Uh, so what happens if you actually look at the, those accounts? Uh, so when you look at those accounts, what we wanted to, uh, to investigate is are, are those accounts high quality or not? Um, so when I say high quality, uh, do those accounts, have, have those accounts been registered by um, essentially unique IPs or is the spammer really doesn't care too much and, uh, and registered from say the same IP or a small set of IPs? So interestingly, we found that uh, most accounts are registered for unique IPs, uh, which is indicative of fairly large botnet networks, which are used to register those accounts. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second is, is the spammer actually caring about the um, end customers? So if I'm selling you those accounts, um, is the spammer actually registering them with some valid email addresses, which are not likely to bounce? Um, and the answer is mostly yes. So the spammer is actually taking care of um, having some pool of email addresses that they probably purchased or control themselves as well, and then attaching them to, to those accounts. Um, the accounts can be pre-aged. So if the spammer is counting on, <coughs> they can having multiple months of being less likely to be suspended. Uh, this is also possible. And uh, there's market for accounts which are both uh, <coughs> Pre-aged and empty, and pre-aged and full. So essentially, you can buy accounts which uh, have actually been connected to um, to other people. So clearly, from from the research perspective, like we want to understand um, how many of those accounts exist, how they evolve, can we track them, can we detect them in time, and if we detect them, what to do with them? Should we just watch them? Should we? Is it more effective from the game theory perspective to um, essentially dampen the reputation or should we do some, some more dramatic action with them? So I want to uh, say a, little, a few words about the, uh, the big data problems versus fast data problems. And, and clearly we are living right now in the world of big data. Um, there's a lot of hype about big data and not necessarily hype, big data is a fact. Um, but especially from the Twitter perspective, there's the, the fast data component in the sense is how important is it to be able to respond to the things which are happening right now or <coughs> have been happening for say the last you know, few minutes, uh, which is a smaller chunk of data versus looking at the much larger chunk of data which may be corresponding to everything that happened in say the last year, last two years, last five years. Um, is there really a, a benefit of pumping up essentially horizontally uh, or pumping up vertically. So to give a perspective, um, this is a result of a study which we did uh, a couple of years ago actually, uh, looking at the, the language modeling as a form of tracking um, topic evolution over time. Uh, so in this case, the topics are connected to, uh, to hashtags. So you can think of a, a hashtag uh, in some cases as being a, a proxy uh, for a good topic, like uh, say NFL in the US is going to be the National Football League, and it's by and large uh, capturing conversations about the actual football players, football players, you know, games, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's other ones like say Apple and iOS 7 and whatnot, which really are very topical. So let's say we want to be able to track what those topics are over time and be able to, say, classify new tweets into those uh, hashtags, even though they don't contain this hashtag. So let's say we do such a study. Um, so this is actually an interesting observation. If you look at the, uh, the black graph, which is the graph in the, the, the line in the precision recall curve, uh, so this line captures the precision recall behavior over a, a a topic model trained with a very large data set of tweets, essentially going historically as far as possible. <clears throat> and those other colors correspond to smoothing this model with a, a very relatively uh, small scale 
um, buffer of the last thousand tweets corresponding to this hashtag. So as you can see, there is injection of new vocabulary, uh, which is quite relevant to the precision recall curve, which can be achieved by looking at this uh, timely data versus just looking at uh, a very large corpus of, of large data, you know, which is historic for this topic. So clearly, there's a lot of value of trying to, to be in sync of what is going on um, with any given topic. But clearly, this is also a hard problem because not all topics um, are, like in this case, connected to a, a, an identifiable hashtag. And also, not all topics are amenable to this kind of simple smoothing, uh, like in the case of language models. Another example of big data versus fast data <coughs> comes from spikes in search queries. Um, so if you look at search queries, uh, which I'm not going to be showing them as graphs here, very often you have spikes in, in queries, um, which can correspond to things which we have seen in the past. So say they may correspond to somebody, um, you know, first and last name, maybe a politician, maybe a movie star. <coughs> and the question is, why do those spikes occur? What, what do they represent? Um, and how should we respond to those spikes in terms of what we show for those queries? So for ex say, for example, you get your favorite politician, and normally what you should be, res what you should be showing to, to such a query is probably the politician's profile, because maybe somebody's looking for this guy. But uh, let's say there is a, a scandal, an affair, some kind of event uh, in which this person participates, so in those cases, essentially, it's more relevant to show something which captures this event. So maybe there's a news article, maybe there's some interesting commentary on Twitter, but not necessarily this person's account. <coughs> so uh, the question is how to get this, this type of information in, uh, in a timely fashion so actually we can respond to those events in search, um, given that those spikes may be very short-lived. So sometimes the spike, the spike only lasts maybe a few hours, and maybe a day, but uh, not necessarily much more. Um, so we've been experimented essentially with uh, real-time human computation where um, the results of the query, the query itself, is being sent to essentially mechanical Turk workers um, who try to give us their opinion about why there's a spike in this query, what this thing represents right now. And essentially we can readjust this information in real time and, uh, and change um, how the ranking is going to respond to those things. So the good thing is that uh, obviously <coughs> this can be done. Uh, the bad thing is that this cannot be done for all queries because there's just too many of them. Uh, but there is a, a happy medium uh, given that there is not as many kind of unusual events corresponding to spiky queries at any given time. So we can actually get the, a real value by using this uh, real-time interaction with crowdsourcing um, at, at the same time, don't break the budget and do things in, in time. What about Googling hashtags? You could use Google search results for, for ranking. You could do that, <laughs> but then you know, you're replacing your, your control, you, you're losing control of, uh, of, of your own ranking, right? And you kind of counting Google is going to solve the problem for you. <laughs> Uh, which is not necessarily true, uh, but you can, in fact, in, in, the, you can, in, in the crowdsourcing perspective, uh, you can integrate all kinds of information in, in trying to figure out why there is something happening. And yes, if there is an event connected to somebody's name, you can use an external search engine uh, to get this information from outside of Twitter, assuming it's not there already. Yes, yeah, so it's definitely possible. Integration of information sources is always a good thing. So lastly, I want to uh, talk about the infrastructure, um, which is maybe not the traditional you know, data mining research area, um, but is increasingly important in terms of addressing the, the scale of data that we have to deal with and doing things efficiently. So uh, when you think about, say, Twitter, um, 
there's 400 million tweets produced per day, which is a fairly uh, large amount in terms of the count. Um, in terms of the, the volume in gigabytes, this is not such a large amount. Um, but if you look at all the events which are connected to those tweets, uh, meaning various clicks and opening actions and this and that, uh, connect this to uh, uh, events and data corresponding to the URLs which come with those tweets and uh, maybe media such as images and videos, uh, this becomes huge. Uh, this becomes very large. Uh, this becomes very large over time. Uh, so you actually need serious data centers to hold this data and be able to process this data. Um, so one of the um, challenges for us, which we are solving over time, is how to produce scalable analytics over this data. So that means we need to be able to keep up with the logging, essentially all the events and all the data on Twitter, and logging in data in such a fashion that can be accessible for data mining, and uh, it can be siphoned off into various production systems, um, the relevant portion of it, uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, <clears throat> so this, tends to be, this turns out to be a fairly difficult problem, which has gone for various iterations in terms of changing the infrastructure. Um, we did a lot of things in Hadoop, but there's very twe various tweaks to Hadoop in how this can be done you know, very efficiently. Um, we have a very good team which, uh, <clears throat> which works on this problem full time. And um, uh, I'm not the best qualified person to actually talk about a lot of those areas, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, they're extremely important to, uh, to be able to essentially provide data for data scientists so that actually some, some research can be done in, in some meaningful way. Uh, so <clears throat> so uh, just to say a few more words about uh, what is the kind of workhorse of our analytics? It's clearly Hadoop. Um, and Hadoop has been not used just by us, but a lot of people in the, in the industry. Um, it's kind of like the go-to place right now in terms of uh, doing big data mining, but it's also not something that can be tuned very easily, so it requires a lot of effort. Uh, in terms of how we actually do things um, in Hadoop, uh, by and large, we use the, the pig which is the scripting language or data flow language for MapReduce jobs, uh, which is quite efficient. Uh, we also use other forms of uh, um, programming in, in, in Hadoop. Uh, one of them is cascading with Scala, which is scolding, uh, which is also open source. Um, so let me just say, say a few words about how we use this for uh, doing our machine learning, uh, which is something that uh, is very close to uh, what I'm doing. So if we do, if we do machine learning, if we do MapReduce in, in Java, which is the language of, of Hadoop, uh, it becomes very verbose. As, uh, this is just like a random example. So most people actually don't tend to do this at all unless they want to optimize something very, very heavily. Uh, so typically what we get is we use pig, which produces a very short uh, script, just as in, in this example. <laughs> Uh, which follows the pattern of just loading the data, transforming in some, some way, filtering it, uh, providing some grouping operators and storing it um, to, um, to disk for, to provide data for the next stage of, uh, of the MapReduce um, chain or essentially to, to, to provide the final output. Um, <coughs> we use this pattern a lot in, uh, in machine learning. Um, and to make it uh, scalable, we uh, take advantage of uh, um, stochastic gradient descent, which I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, in a second, um, of parallelism uh, offered by ensembles of uh, simple classifiers, such as linear classifiers or classifiers composed of uh, small decision trees. Um, we also take advantage of uh, not doing things on Hadoop unless necessary. Uh, which I'm going to be talking about last. Uh, before we go into this, just a few words about uh, what kind of models we want to do when we do machine learning um, internally. Um, so machine learning is a, is a very uh, a big field at this point, uh, capturing very complex models, very simple models. Uh, we like the very simple. Uh, if we can, uh, and it turns out because we're using a lot of Twitter, a lot of text data. Uh, simple models work fairly well because text is very, very friendly for linear models 
uh, linear models are very friendly for scalability. So, so that's kind of uh, what we try to do first, and only if it doesn't work, we want to go into something more complex. Um, I mentioned we do things in PIG, and PIG is extendable in the form of user-defined functions, and that's essentially where all machine learning lives when we do things in PIG and MapReduce, uh, which is very friendly for other people trying to use this thing because they don't need to modify anything uh, in their PIG script other than just interfacing with the UDF functions, which uh, tends to be a fairly, uh, fairly small component in the MapReduce job. There is one caveat of doing uh, things on the cluster, uh, is that clusters are typically composed of essentially commodity boxes, and commodity boxes on the cluster are not very big. And even if they are fairly big, if they contain multiple reducers in a single box, then each of those reducers is going to be limited in terms of the number of RAM that they have. So if you think about running a huge, say, SVM, multiple iteration type job in the reducer uh, is going to be limited quite heavily by, by the amount of RAM uh, which can be used to hold the data set. So this is typically what you don't want to be uh, doing when doing things in Hadoop. Uh, you want to be doing things which in some way fit on the single reducer or can be streamed through the reducer uh, instead of being stored in a single chunk. So that's the kind of constraint you have to work with um, when you do MapReduce jobs, unless you spend a, a fair amount of engineering and research into doing things in parallel, as some people have done. <coughs> so I want to just introduce why and how you do the streaming using uh, support, using the stochastic gradient descent. Um, so just a few slides about um, providing motivation for this. So typically in machine learning, as uh, most people know, we have some data set uh, which corresponds feature vectors and, and labels, whether well, labels are class labels are, or the target values for regression. Um, and essentially we have some kind of a loss function which we try to minimize. Um, so very often we have logistic loss or squared loss or some other loss that is appropriate. And, uh, we have essentially an optimization problem we're trying to solve in this particular way. And what we choose to, what we choose to, to solve it is very often a form of gradient descent. Um, as, as you can see here, what you're solving is essentially the batch gradient descent where you compute the loss function over your whole training data. And uh, in the kind of iterative sense, you need to run something over the whole data, compute this loss function, and then update the weight vector, and then go to the next iteration. And as I mentioned, this is something you don't actually want to be doing uh, in a single reducer, because that implies you have to keep a large data set in memory, uh, and you may not be able to do so. So what you do, you go into some kind of an approximation of this, uh, where you compute the loss function on the instance level. So essentially every time we see a new instance, we compute this loss function and update the weight vector accordingly. Uh, so clearly this doesn't require us to hold much more than just the weight vector, and you can stream the whole data set through it. Of course, there is a, <coughs> there is a caveat to this as well, uh, and this can be a mistake which people do in, uh, in data mining over MapReduce is that this requires an assumption that the data has been randomized in some way, uh, so we don't have essentially the case where, say, the first end of examples correspond to your positive label and the last uh, part corresponds to your negative label, because then the expectation of this function actually being correct is quite low. Uh, <coughs> there is another uh, point in terms of uh, applying MapReduce in the streaming fashion is that we're streaming to a single node. Um, and to some extent, if we have like a, a very massive data set, um, that's going to produce this, a very big hit in terms of the network traffic go up, pumping everything into a single location. Uh, so we're not really taking advantage of the parallelism of the cluster. Uh, we only do it for the feature extraction, but then if the induction still takes, you know, pumping everything to a single node, 
it may take quite a while to, for this thing to, co to converge uh, and finish. Uh, so how to take advantage of the fact that the cluster actually is composed by, by a lot of machines? Uh, so the natural answer is to use ensembles. <coughs> and ensembles are very robust and uh, are very good. Um, can be composed of uh, linear models, can be composed of uh, various nonlinear models, uh, such as decision trees. And it's definitely something to try, and we have tried, um, when doing things on, on the cluster. So the, just to give a, an example of what, the, how the, what is the difference between running a single model and an ensemble model, the difference is very small. So in a single model case, we just uh, get our data um, loaded from disk, transformed in the MapReduce job, and essentially pumped through a single reducer using the stochastic gradient descent. Um, and we store the results as a model. Um, if we have ensembles, we're essentially doing the same thing. Uh, we just uh, produce the same intermediate stage by the mappers and just send it to multiple reducers, uh, each corresponding to a single view of the data, if you like. And we store the ensemble on disk. And uh, operationally, once this model is created, everything well, works the same. We just have a model, apply it to data, and we're done. Um, <coughs> And so that's your question is, do the ensembles actually help? Um, and I'd like to show this particular test case um, uh, just to give you an over, a feel if, um, if doing things in parallel actually makes any difference, especially for linear models. Uh, so this is a uh, tweet sentiment classification task uh, we kind of did for, for fun um, a couple of years ago. Um, we didn't have a lot of labels created by humans, but they used the emoticons as proxies for class labels. The smileys were clearly uh, positive sentiment. The frownies were the negative sentiment proxies. Uh, we collected a whole bunch of tweets uh, cor corresponding to those emoticons, stripped them out, uh, tokenized things with character programs, so very, uh, a very dumb tokenization, but uh, we just were curious if it worked or not. <coughs> So the interesting things here um, is the, uh, the question, first of all, um, do we get any help by looking at more and more data? So even if we have a single classifier, going from 1 million to 10 million to 100 million examples clearly helps. So there is an argument that you know, a lot of people have been using, say, Google, uh, for example, having more data or big data um, is definitely helping, especially for um, things like this, where we can get labels organically. Uh, we don't need to ask for, for uh, human labels via crowdsourcing and some other expensive process. Um, the in other interesting observation is, even though in this case um, we looked at uh, ensembles of linear models, going from a, a single model case to a model corresponding to uh, <coughs> uh, to just 10 uh, 10 linear models in parallel, we get a, quite a bit of a boost in performance just by doing that. Um, so if you look at the, um, if you essentially are very orthodox in terms of thinking that um, ensembles are only work if they're composed uh, by, say, ensembles of decision trees versus ensemble of linear models, this is not always the case. And there are cases where um, we're doing simple things actually work even in the uh, in the case of using linear models as, uh, as elements of ensemble. And there is a law of diminishing returns in terms of um, using more and more uh, models as part of the ensemble. <coughs> so lastly, there is uh, stream-based learning. Uh, so those things I talked about really correspond to learning on Hadoop, uh, which kind of looks at the old data and possibly big data uh, but how do we actually learn in real time? Uh, how do we actually uh, incorporate the user feedback, which is happening in real time, as a form of updating our models? And as I showed before, uh, this is the potential of actually being uh, uh, responsible for quite a bit of a boost in, uh, in our performance or maintaining the performance as is. <coughs> uh, so we're experimenting with various technologies to make it happen. Uh, one thing we like uh, to use uh, internally is Storm, 
which we open sourced as well. Uh, so that's a way of uh, um, connecting various um, data producing nodes uh, with data consuming nodes in real time and uh, performing things in a streaming fashion. Um, there are a lot of open issues in terms of how best to essentially perform machine learning in a streaming fashion, which I don't think has been solved by us or anybody else yet. Um, you know, some things which are, um, are kind of, uh, which need to be answered is uh, how to actually maintain your target performance level when you do this. Um, given that, say, various classification models are um, sensitive to decision threshold, what do we do with those thresholds over time? Do we keep the same ones? Do we adjust them? Um, how do we calibrate models? How do we respond to changes of uh, uh, distribution of uh, content in real time? Other questions are, for example, should we be updating models or just updating the features? So for example, is it sufficient to just have the same model, but maybe you know, keep track of the uh, new arrival of new content or new entities appearing in the content and just uh, injecting them into the, the feature representation? Or do we need to be doing both? Um, so again, those are the things for which we don't have definitive answers, but definitely something we're looking at. And, uh, <coughs> and lastly, the, the role of big boxes. I mentioned before that uh, we do a lot of things in, in Hadoop. Uh, and those are definitely large scale uh, uh, cluster installations. But interestingly, there's actually quite a bit of a value of using uh, single box solutions for a lot of cases. Um, especially if uh, we're talking about human label data, which rarely goes into the realm of really big data. And uh, I'm going to start with an example of the cassowary, which is the, the name of the uh, <coughs> uh, service doing the whom to follow classification. Uh, so cassowary uh, is something which we actually open sourced last year. And uh, till uh, last year was responsible for doing all the who to follow recommendations for Twitter. And interestingly, this was a single server solution. Not in the sense that there was only one instance of the server doing all the recommendations. It was uh, replicated in, in, in a cluster fashion. But you can think of doing all the graph mining algorithms necessary for doing who to follow recommendations for the Twitter graph perform at a very large box. And the box was very large, but it was still at the upper end of the um, commodity, commodity box range that we see today. Uh, so for example, today we can get things which uh, contain 200 gigs of RAM, uh, which you know, a few years ago was uh, out of the budget of a lot of people, um, but can be thought of being kind of the upper range of, uh, of the commodity spectrum. And if you can think of what kind of machine learning you can do on such a box, uh, you can fit a lot of pretty big data sets, and uh, especially data sets containing a lot of labeled data into such a machine and actually be quite productive. Um, <clears throat> so we're not very orthodox in terms of saying, okay, everything should be done in Hadoop or everything you know, should be done in a single box, but just the question of mixing and matching what makes sense in, in any particular case. So this is really my last slide. Uh, so I'm going to thank you for the attention and if there are more questions, I'll be happy to answer them.